Hey YouTube, I'm Jimmy. In this video, I'm going to walk through my analysis of Caterpillar, ticker symbol CAT. This continues our series where we're analyzing all 30 stocks in the Dow Jones Industrial Average with the ultimate goal of taking that analysis and trying to build a great portfolio. This is the fifth video in that series, and you can see a link to each of the other videos in the description below. So Caterpillar's business is broken into two main segments, machinery and financial products. The financial product segment is mostly just Cat Financial, which basically lets Caterpillar provide financial opportunities to their customers. And it's only about six or 7% of total revenue of Caterpillar. Now the machinery segment is actually called Machinery, Energy and Transportation Systems. And it's further broken down into construction industries, energy and transportation, and resource industries. Last year, construction industries accounted for about 45% of total revenue. Energy and transportation accounted for about 37% of revenue, and 18% was by resource industries. So Caterpillar segments are based on their target customers. So the construction industry segment focuses on customers in the infrastructure, forestry, mining, and building construction industries. Now, they have different products that focus on different geographies as well. For example, the customers in developing economies often prefer a lower purchase price, so Caterpillar has products specifically designed to meet their needs. While in the developed economies, uh, customers often prefer products that have a lower cost to operate the machine over the course of the product's entire life. The energy and transportation segment goes after customers that are in the oil and gas industry, power generation, marine, railroad, and a few other similar industries. They sell products like generators, marine propulsion systems, gas turbines, and products along those lines. The resource industry segment focuses on products in mining, quarry, uh, waste and material handling, and their products are used to extract copper, iron ore, coal, oil sands, gold, and things like that. They sell things like hydraulic shovels, uh, trucks, landfill compactors, mining system, and the list goes on and on. Okay, so now we know what Caterpillar does. Now let's take a peek at the financial performance. So in recent history, Caterpillar's revenue topped out in 2012 and declined every year until 2016, where it looks like it might have bottomed out. And since then, it has been growing nicely. The purple bar is the past 12 months, and the two green bars to the right, well, they're analyst estimates for 2018 and 2019. Now we can swap out that revenue chart with an earnings per share chart, and we can see a similar story. So the primary difference to me is that where revenue topped out in 2012, it looks like earnings per share has recovered nicely over the past 12 months, enough to surpass the 2012 EPS level. And EPS projections out to 2019 look like Caterpillar should be rolling along nicely from a profit standpoint. Now what makes this even more interesting is this chart here. This is net income margins. Once again, 2016 was a bad year from many perspectives. But since then, it looks like Caterpillar is recovering nicely and net income margins look great. Now, I will point one thing out. This last blue bar here, this is 2017. The purple bar, which is the last four quarters, includes two quarters from 2017 and the first two quarters of 2018. So that's real, that actually happened. But the next two, next two green bars, well, they're just analyst projections. And it's important to keep this in mind for now that for now, these are just estimates. And to me, these estimates are one of the most interesting parts of Caterpillar's whole story. Are these projections just analyst excitement and they're getting caught up in the moment as margins have already jumped to almost 12% over the past four quarters? Or are they real numbers? I didn't care if margins end up being exactly what the analysts say. I believe that in 2018, they say it's 12.6% uh, profit margins in, in 20. 19, I believe it's expected to be 12.7. But either way, if it's anywhere up in this area, that would be a good thing for Caterpillar and for shareholders. Okay, that being said, can we come up with a fair value for Caterpillar's stock? I think one important point that I uncovered in my research is that many of Caterpillar's business segments, well, they appear to be in the early innings of an uptrend. Some good examples are industries like mining, offshore oil and gas, U.S. construction, China construction, and I think it's this realization that there's still plenty of upside that ultimately led to analysts having such promising projections out for the next couple of years. So here's a free cash flow valuation I put together for Caterpillar stock. So in a recent video I did on Boeing, 
I did a more thorough review of how I came up with the different numbers that go into a discounted cash flow analysis. And if you want to go back, you can see that there's a link to the in the description below to that video. And I start touching on the discounted cash flow stuff at about the four and a half minute mark. So if you want, you can skip over to that. But basically, what I said in that video was that I like to be a bit more conservative when it comes to trying to come up with valuation. So if I'm going to round numbers, I try to do it, I try to round them in a more conservative direction. So for Caterpillar stock, I used a WAC, which is weighted average cost of capital of about 9%. For Boeing, I had used 9.5%. But don't forget that WAC is very company specific. It takes into account both the debt of that company and the estimated cost of that company's equity. So you can't just use the same WAC all across the board. For this, we're using 9%. Now, when I had cut down the actual calculation, it came up to about 8.9%. Now, for a perpetual growth rate, I used 2.5%. 2.5% is the same one I used in Boeing. And that the perpetual growth rate should be a bit more tied to the overall historic or uh, future growth of the economy. And I think 2.5% is a fairly conservative view. I could have easily made a case for 3%, but once again, I like to be a bit more conservative. So 2.5% it is. Now, as you can see, when we plug all this in and discount projected cash flows to today, well, it tells us that Caterpillar stock should be worth close to $199 per share. Considering that it's trading at about $150 a share right now, this looks like pretty good upside to me. Okay, but what about some other valuation methods? Discounted cash flow isn't the only way to do it. Well, if we look at PE multiples, Caterpillar stock is currently trading at a forward PE of about 12 times next year's earnings. To put that in perspective, the S&P 500 is currently trading at about 18 times next year's earnings. In fact, if we look at Caterpillar's own historical PE multiple, we'll see that their five-year average is about 18 times next year's earnings, and their 10-year average is about 16 times next year's earnings. So, by most measures, according to the PE multiple, Caterpillar looks like it's fairly undervalued at $150 right now. Okay, so out of those numbers, let's take the most conservative number and use 16 times forward earnings. Well, EPS estimates for the next four quarters are a hair over $12 a share. I think it was actually about $12.07. So if we take that $12.07, multiply it by 16 times next year earnings, that would imply that the fair value right now is about $193 a share. Once again, with the current share price of about $150, Caterpillar looks like it's a pretty good value right now. So overall, I think Caterpillar has a real potential to make our ideal portfolio. The fact that the industry still seems poised for growth puts Caterpillar in a decent position when it comes to our need to identify long-term great opportunities. But the real hole in our fair value estimates, both of which point to a fair value closer to $200 compared to the $150 that it's trading at today, well, the assumption here is that analyst estimates are correct, and or at least in the ballpark of correct. And that may not always be the case. So ultimately, what each of us have to determine individually is do we believe that analyst estimates are at least close going out the next few years? So my question for you is, what about your research? Does your research tell you anything different from what my research uncovered? Let me know what you think in the comments below. And if you haven't done so already, feel free to hit the subscribe button. And thank you for sticking around all the way to the end, and I'll see you in the next video. Thanks.